Now more on gun law enforcement. Earlier today, National Rifle Association President Charlton Heston and others testified before House Subcommittee on the effectiveness of Project Exile, a gun law enforcement program in Richmond, Virginia. Congressman John Micah of Florida chaired the two-hour, 20-minute hearing. Good morning. I'd like to call this uh, meeting of the Subcommittee on Criminal Justice, Drug Policy, and Human Resources to order. We'll start uh, today's uh, hearing uh, by having opening statements uh, from uh, members of the committee. We have uh, two panels this morning, and the topic of today's uh, hearing is uh, Project Exile, a case study in successful gun law enforcement. And I'll, I'll begin with an opening statement, then we'll yield to other members. Today's hearing before the Subcommittee on Criminal Justice, Drug Policy, and Human Resources will examine Project Exile, a gun law enforcement program initiated uh, in Richmond, Virginia. The, this approach has been so successful that it is now being replicated statewide uh, as Virginia Exile, and also numerous cities across the nation from Rochester, New York, to Denver, Colorado, are adopting uh, programs modeled after Project Exile. Today's hearing will examine the elements and experiences of this successful crime-fighting initiative and consider some of the benefits of implementing Project Exile approaches to gun law enforcement on a broader basis. We'll hear today from witnesses who I believe are very knowledgeable about the Richmond experience uh, with Project Exile. At the time it began, Richmond was among the top five cities in the nation with the highest per capita murder rates. In 1997, an assistant uh, United States attorney with the support of his office began a coordinated effort with local police, state police, and federal investigators, including the uh, FBI, and the ATF, along with uh, local and federal prosecutors to respond to serious crime and gun violence. Project uh, officials enlisted support from a coalition of businesses, civic organizations, community, and church leaders. Since the project began, the results have been evident. More than 200 armed criminals were removed from Richmond streets during the first year of Project Exile alone. An entire gang responsible for multiple murders has been dismantled. In 1998, murders were 33% below 1997, the lowest number since 1987. In 1999, murders are down uh, yet another 29%. Today we'll hear that a key element of Project Exile has been, in fact, the ability to prosecute in federal court cases that involve felons with guns, or drugs and guns, or domestic violence and guns. The advantage of federal prosecutions include stiff bond rules and tough sentences, including minimum uh, mandatory sentences. Another innovation of Project Exile has been its outreach and advertising effort. Much of the financial support for the media has come from the private sector uh, contributions and donations. The media message uh, in this program is quite simple. An illegal gun will get you five years in federal prison. In Richmond, and now in other areas in the state, the message is conveyed by television, radio, and billboards. By all informed accounts, Project Exile has been successful and has saved lives. Virginia has now passed its own tough laws so that federal prosecutions are often unnecessary. Project Exile has received bipartisan support and support from a wide range of groups seeking to protect our citizens ranging from the National Rifle Association to Handgun Control Incorporated. By learning as much as we can about
Project Exile success, we can assist our law enforcement officers, prosecutors, and communities in replicating the project's uh, successes. I'm very pleased today that we have such a uh, distinguished group in testify. I uh, want to also uh, divert a second from my uh, prepared comments and just say that uh, we had planned this hearing um, for some time. It is unfortunate that we have had several uh, horrendous uh, incidents uh, involving uh, firearms, uh, both in Hawaii, where our ranking uh, member is from, and then I guess last yesterday in uh, uh, Seattle, uh, and uh, this is most unfortunate. Uh, I had coffee this morning and picked up this Washington Post story of crimes uh, in the district. This is Thursday, November 4th today, and it cites the homicides um, in the District of Columbia. Let me just read a couple of these. Uh, October 16th, an identified person was found unconscious with multiple gunshot wounds to the head. That's the first one. An another one, an unidentified man was found unconscious in the street with gunshot wo wounds to the head. Uh, another, another one on Morris Street, an unidentified person was found in the back seat of a car with multiple gunshot wounds to the body. And I'll skip to uh, the northwest section. An unidentified person was found with gunshot wounds to the chest. Then to the southeast section, uh, Sterling Avenue, an unidentified person was found on the s sidewalk with gunshot wound to the leg. The victim was taken to D.C. General Hospital, where he's pronounced dead. All of these are homicides deaths. Another one on Langston Place, a 24-year-old, and most of these are young uh, males in the most productive uh, period of their life, found in the street with gunshot wounds to the neck, shoulder, and chest. On Yuma Street, an unidentified man was found in the street with a gunshot wound to the lower back in the southwest section of the city. On First Street, an unidentified man was found in a car with a gunshot wound to the head. That's just today's uh, uh, report from Washington. We do know that projects like Project Exile work where you have tough enforcement. Where is the uh, chart that we had here? Uh, if we look at, uh, they put it over there. Uh, uh, if we look at New York City, which has also had a zero tolerance under the leadership of Mayor Giuliani, we see murders down some 70 percent, uh, from over 2,000 to uh, 600, uh, just a little over 600, an incredible success story. So we need to find out what we need to do to make uh, our streets safer, our communities safer, if it's projects like this, Project Exile, if it's increased uh, mental health uh, support, uh, we need that. If it's a tough enforcement and zero tolerance, uh, I think the public uh, and the Congress will demand that we take uh, action. So I'm very pleased today to highlight a successful program, one again that brings together diverse uh, interests, uh, some on different ends of the uh, spectrum uh, relating to gun control, but all determined to make a difference. We're extremely pleased to have Mr. Charlton Heston, a recognized figure throughout the world, is now helping to lead the effort to bring national attention to the success of Project Exile. We're also pleased to have the top prosecutor for the state of Virginia, Attorney General uh, Mark Early, a strong uh, supporter of Project uh, Exile, who's now working to institute uh, Project uh, Virginia Exile. Likewise, we are honored to have the United States Attorney from the Eastern District of Virginia, Mrs. Ms. Helen uh, Fahey, who supervises the office that began the project and has actively promoted its success. On our second panel, we're also Fortunate to have a frontline law enforcement official from Richmond, Deputy uh, Chief Teresa Gooch, uh, who has 
seen the success of uh, Project Exile firsthand. Uh, the Deputy Chief is devoted to continuing the project's success and in saving uh, lives each day and every day. <clears throat> Finally, we are honored to have a leading researcher on the topic of, of federal gun law enforcement, Dr. Susan Long, and look forward to uh, hearing about her research findings on this topic. Finally, I'm very thankful that we have many talented law enforcement officials and career <laughs> attorneys who day in and day out work to promote the safety of our citizens and families. It's my hope that we can help ensure that the federal government and uh, state government and uh, other agencies uh, work together to do whatever is uh, needed to help resolve the problems we have in this area. I intend to uh, urge the Department of Justice to do much more in supporting this life-saving initi initiative. There will be some questions we ask today, and one of the questions before us is, uh, why save lives only in Richmond? Why not do this in Washington, D.C., our nation's capital? And I just read of the, the tragedy in this morning's paper. Uh, and why not across the nation? I'd like to thank all of our witnesses for appearing today, and I look forward to hearing from each of you as we explore how we can repeat the success of Project Exile and protect our communities and our families throughout the land. Please now to yield to our ranking member, the gentlelady from Hawaii, Mrs. Mink. I uh, thank the chairman for uh, yielding me time, and I certainly want to uh, join with him in acknowledging the importance of today's hearings and to extend my own uh, welcome to the distinguished witnesses that have been uh, invited to testify at uh, these hearings. It's an important uh, effort on the part of the oversight uh, responsibilities of Congress to look at the various programs that have been put in place that are under the jurisdiction of the federal government. And Project Exile is certainly one of those programs that uh, merits our attention. As the chairman said uh, a few days ago, Hawaii was shocked uh, by an incident that took the lives of seven people in a otherwise quiet and benign neighborhood uh, in the offices of the Xerox Corporation. And while uh, this has been uh, a, an incident that has never occurred uh, in Hawaii ever before, what it illustrates is that it could happen anywhere. And so the whole subject of um, uh, homicides and, and crimes of this nature are important uh, considerations that all levels of government must pay attention to. The Congress has been wrestling with various uh, legislation dealing with uh, gun control, gun safety, and many of my constituents who write to me about the issue emphasize the importance of law enforcement and their concern that <clears throat> the control of guns are not going to uh, eliminate criminals. We have to go against criminals. I mean, that is the, the little postcard that we get. And so it's important to look at it from their perspective, but it certainly doesn't diminish my interest and support for uh, control legislation that still languishes uh, in the Congress and has not come to a, a final um, enactment. The Project Exile is a program that is designed to prosecute criminals that are apprehended uh, in the commission of a crime with a gun. It was initiated in March 1997. As of 98 September, the project was responsible for the conviction of over 200 people and the seizure of over 400 guns. It's credited with a 33% decline in Richmond's homicide rate and a 30% decline in the armed robberies in that city. These are impressive numbers, and this oversight committee uh, needs to explore the success of this achievement and examine uh, the costs also to the federal government. 
Project Exile, after all, uses federal law enforcement officers, federal investigators, federal prosecutors uh, to process the crimes. Uh, and if convicted, the uh, criminals go to a federal prison. I'm reminded by the words of Chief Justice Rehnquist, who in his 1998 year-end report cautioned against increased federalization of crimes. Rehnquist admonished that the threshold criteria for federal prosecution of essentially state offenses is something that we need to caution ourselves about. Clearly, that uh, threshold argument needs to be examined by this committee. Mr. Chairman, a recent federal court op opinion called Project Exile a substantial federal incursion into a sovereign state's area of authority and responsibility. And that is a matter which I believe is appropriate for this committee to consider in these deliberations. We're all interested in reducing uh, crime in our communities, in our state, and throughout the country. And so any innovation such as Project Exile, if it works and can be supported and substantiated, is a program that needs to be replicated in other areas of the country. So, Mr. Chairman, again, I thank you for holding these hearings and look forward to the testimony by these witnesses. Thank you. Thank you, gentlelady. Now pleased to introduce the uh, vice uh, chairman of our panel, a uh, gentleman who has uh, been very active in trying to uh, call attention to uh, Project Exile and really responsible uh, some time ago for encouraging the subcommittee uh, to take up this uh, subject uh, and the success of this project and uh, also to call this uh, hearing. Uh, the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Barr, you're recognized. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate the distinguished panels that we have today and the police officers that are with us today also uh, as an illustration of their support for this program. And I know everybody in this room, not just those of us on this panel, uh, wants to recognize the tremendous sacrifice that our men and women in blue make every single day, and we do appreciate it very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, sometimes we drive ourselves crazy up here in Washington trying to be rocket scientists and come up with all sorts of newfangled ideas and unusual approaches to problems and plug all sorts of things into these vast computers that we have up here to try and solve problems. And sometimes we lose sight of the forest for the trees. Uh, Project Exile illustrates not that you need to be a rocket scientist to solve the problem of crime in our communities, but you just need to use good common sense and the tools that have been available to us, to prosecutors and to police officers and public officials uh, since we have existed as a nation. And that is our laws, uh, in this case the criminal code of this country, uh, and in the case of Virginia, the criminal code of Virginia, uh, and the manpower uh, existing already in our federal prosecutor's offices, our state prosecutor's offices, our local prosecutor's offices, and our police offices in our communities. You don't need to reinvent the wheel to solve the problem of crime in America, and that is an important message that Project Exile brings. Uh, one of the most interesting uh, aspects, I think, Mr. Chairman, of Project Exile in my review of the uh, voluminous uh, material that's been uh, uh, printed about it uh, is the fact that it brings together uh, people with otherwise very differing views of some of the issues that consume our time here uh, in Washington uh, in support of a program that actually works. It helps our children. It helps our citizens. Uh, and I speak particularly of two agencies that are both very active in their own spheres of influence, the National Rifle Association, which has been very supportive uh, of Project Exile and other projects across America that help law enforcement officers, and Handgun Control, Inc. Uh, the phenomena uh, that Ms. Fahey and Mr. Schiller in uh, putting Project Exile into, uh, into force and uh, Virginia Exile by Mr. Early and the governor in bringing the NRA and Handgun Control Inc. together in praising a program as something that's rivaled in the annals of human history, perhaps only by Mr. Heston's parting of the Red Sea. Uh, and it's been many years since that occurred, and uh, the bringing together of such otherwise disparate groups in praise of a program that really works is something that I think we all ought to take a moment to think about, to reflect on, and do what we can, as you're doing here today, Mr. Chairman, through this hearing, uh, to try and encourage 
the Department of Justice to use this program all across America and to encourage states uh, insofar as we and Mr. Early and Governor Gilmour can, through their persuasive abilities, to use and institute Project Exile in communities uh, all across America, because it does work. Uh, if you have a gun, you're going to do the time. As the sign in front of Ms. Fahey says, an illegal gun gets you five years in federal prison. Uh, that is a very simple message, but it's a profound one. It works because the men and women here today and Mr. Schiller and others who have been so active in this program recognize that each one of them as citizens uh, can indeed have an impact if they just use the tools available to them. Uh, and uh, I think it's phenomenal, Ms. Fahey, that this program works in the way that it does because you have marshaled, coordinated a comprehensive effort uh, here in the community and it goes beyond simply the law enforcement effort you have, you have brought into this effort. Uh, the state authorities you have brought into this effort as uh, your literature and other literature uh, clearly illustrates the private sector community, chambers of commerce, uh, private organizations uh, that have given not only their time in support of the program but their resources as well to publicize it because we also know that no matter how good a project or a program is, if people don't know that it exists, its success is going to be severely limited. So uh, it is a phenomenal project and a program that, uh, that we encourage the Department of Justice to pay more attention to, to use more because it does work. Uh, and I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for bringing together these distinguished panels and those of us here today in support of this effort to exercise oversight responsibility in a way that uh, perhaps too infrequently we have the opportunity to do, and that is in praise of a government program. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Barrett. Now I'd like to recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Turner. You're recognized. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for holding this hearing. Uh, anything that uh, any state or local government can do to uh, prosecute more vigorously those who have illegal far firearms, uh, I certainly support. And I think that when we look at this issue, we need to all keep in mind that, that it's best approached on a bipartisan, in a bipartisan way. Uh, efforts to strengthen our laws, to put more policemen on the streets. Uh, these are goals that we all hold, irrespective of what party we may be in. And I think it's a uh, credit to, to the chair today to hold this hearing on a program that, that is working that does work and that I hope that many other states uh, will adopt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Turner. I'd like to recognize now a distinguished gentleman from Arkansas, I guess uh, our second U.S. attorney or, uh, and member of the Judiciary Committee on our uh, subcommittee panel, Mr. Hutchinson, you're recognized. I thank the chair and just make a few comments because I'm anxious to hear the testimony of these distinguished witnesses. And I certainly agree that we in Congress should focus on things that do not work well in government to uh, uh, make sure we remedy problems, but we should also focus on those things that work well to highlight those. And I see that this is an opportunity today. I uh, do believe that uh, in other areas of the country we can look uh, to Virginia and Project Exile that has worked so well there. But at the same time, I was impressed uh, by the uh, testimony of U.S. Attorney Fay, who emphasized from the Department of Justice standpoint that uh, you know each jurisdiction needs to determine what works best for them and I think we do need to have that type of flexibility so this is one example of something that works well that might work well in another part of the country uh, but uh, as a US attorney in a small jurisdiction uh, there's a lot to cover a lot to do and I do hope that we can maintain uh, that type of flexibility that we can see what works best in every different area of the country and and learn from each other to uh, uh, see how we can improve uh, our prosecutions of, of violent crime. So with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I look forward to the testimony of the distinguished panel. I thank the uh, gentleman, and now we'll go to our first panel. Our first panel, again, consists of Mr. Charlton Heston, President of the National Rifle Association, uh, the Honorable Mark uh, Early, Attorney General of the State of Virginia, and the Honorable Helen uh, Fahey, and she is uh, the United States Attorney for the Eastern District of Virginia. Uh, first, let me uh, inform the uh, panel and witnesses that this is an Investigations and Oversight Subcommittee of Congress. In just a uh, moment, I will swear you in. We do swear in all of our uh, witnesses. 
Also, um, we try to ask you to limit your uh, oral remarks to about five minutes. Uh, since there are only three, we'll be a little bit liberal with the time. Um, but uh, if you have lengthy or additional statements or data information you'd like to be made part of the record, uh, we will uh, do that. Um, and uh, that will be done by unanimous consent. At this time, I'd like to ask our witnesses uh, if they could. Uh, could you please stand and be sworn? Could you please stand? Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give before this subcommittee of Congress is the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I so swear. <clears throat> the witnesses... Uh, record will reflect answered in the affirmative and I'd like to again welcome you thank you each for your participation we have a very distinguished uh, first panel first uh, uh, witness really needs no introduction uh, as, as Mr. Barr said we hope uh, he can help us apart the uh, seas here uh, on uh, and also uh, lead us uh, from exile uh, uh, and uh, give us more information about his cooperative effort and support of Project Exile today. So, Mr. Heston, welcome, and you're recognized, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the honorable ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I must begin, just take a sentence to uh, clarify for the honorable gentleman from Georgia. Uh, I have only limited control over that staff, you understand. It, it, to actually use it, I need instructions from <laughs> much higher body, but I am also, I must confess to you, a little bit tired this morning. I had an engagement in St. Louis, which didn't get me to Washington, to my surprise, till 1.15 in the morning, but uh, I will try to do my best for you. Um, and I would also like to limit, in the interest of compressing the hearing as appropriately as possible, I would like not to talk about the issues we disagree on. That's, that's open knowledge. We know where, where we disagree. I would rather instead focus on what is not in dispute, indeed, what is indisputable. There is no dispute that just 150 miles from here in sleepy Richmond, Virginia, they cut homicides by one half in just one year. They employed the awesome simplicity of enforcing existing federal gun laws. It's called, as you know, Project Exile. The word's out now in the streets of Richmond. If you were a felon caught with a gun, you will go to jail. Five years. No plea bargaining, no profile. Five years. They're actually changing criminal behavior down there and saving lives. Now, that's not partisan. That's not conjecture, it's not hyperbole. That is a fact. Thanks to the fearless prosecutors whom the chairman has recognized, innocent Americans are alive today in Richmond that would have died at the hands of armed felons. But elsewhere across this land, innocent Americans are alive today, will be dead tomorrow, or next month, or next year, because this administration as a policy, is putting gun-toting felons on the streets in record numbers. Now, if you don't believe me or the NRA, believe the recent independent Syracuse University studies, which revealed that federal prosecutions of gun crimes have dropped by 44% during the Clinton-Gore administration. Right here, in our nation's capital, there were some 2,400 violent crimes committed with firearms last year. Guess how many of those were prosecuted? Two. Two out of 2,400 arrested. In fact, in little old Richmond, there were more prosecutions under federal gun laws in that one state, that one city, that in California, New Jersey, New York, and Washington, D.C. combined. I find that a staggering statement. Now, why does the president, I ask myself and I ask you, ask for more federal gun laws if he's not going to enforce the ones we already have, which is 22,000? This deadly charade is killing people and will surely kill more. 
When political hot air is turning into cold blood, when the duplicitous spin is becoming lethal, lethal, someone's got to speak up. Why does the president ask for more police if he won't prosecute their arrests? No lives will be saved talking about how many hours a waiting period should be, or how many rounds a magazine should hold, or how cheap a Saturday night special should be. But if you want to impact gun crime now, you really must demand, you must demand that Project Exile be implemented in major U.S. cities now. I wish you luck, a lot of luck. For a year, we have challenged, urged, and pleaded with the Clinton administration to take $50 million, $50 million, out of $14 billion budget and implement Project Exile's enforcement program nationwide. What was their response? A Justice Department spokesman told USA Today, I quote, it's not the federal government's role to prosecute these gun cases. I, I think also of a session, Senator Sessions held a hearing last summer in which, in fact, someone from the administration, I do not know who, appeared and was asked this question, why won't you prosecute? And I'm not kidding. His answer was, well, we have come to the conclusion that if you incarcerate a felon for a crime, his place will simply be taken by another felon. I submit that is the most ridiculous statement I've ever heard offered in a governmental discourse. Deputy Attorney General Eric Holder ridiculed Project Exile as a cookie-cutter approach to fighting crime. Cookie-cutting. He called it fundamentally wrong to earmark funds for enforcing federal gun laws. Fundamentally wrong, he said. A senior official of the BATF tried to explain away the 44% decrease in federal prosecutions of gun crimes by saying, well, we seek to pr prosecute few sharks at the top rather than the numerous guff guppies of the criminal enterprise. Mr. Chairman, those guppies with guns are murdering innocent Americans who are left defenseless by a White House and a Justice Department that lack either the time or the spine to enforce existing gun laws against violent criminals. We challenge Bill Clinton to direct Attorney General Janet Reno to call upon all the district attorneys around this country and instruct them to take on just 10 just 10 more federal gun cases every month. That is their job, after all. The result would be the prosecution of about 10,000. 10,000 more violent felons with guns. 10,000 potential murderers taken off the streets of America. And we urge this body to do what the White House won't, to appropriate $50 million to implement Project Exile in major cities across the country. And if the president calls that fundamentally wrong, ask him what you call it when the odds of doing time for armed crime are no worse than the flip of a coin. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. We'll withhold questions till we've heard from all uh, of our witnesses. Our next uh, witness is uh, the Honorable Mark Early. Uh, the Attorney uh, General from the state of Virginia who's taken on uh, advocacy of Project Exile, and I see from uh, your biography you have a great interest in making this a success. I think you have six children, is that correct? Uh, that's uh, uh, a great uh, concern for the future. Welcome and you're recognized, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Again, uh, my name is Mark Early, and I'm the Attorney General for the Commonwealth of Virginia. For many years, uh, it's hard to believe the capital of Richmond was called the murder capital of the world. And it was because, as your chairman has noted, that of the major cities in the U.S., we bore a very uh, unhonorable distinction, and that was having an incredibly number of murders per capita in our city. In fact, it peaked in 1997 with 170 homicides. 
Under the leadership of Helen Fahey, the United States Attorney for the Eastern District of Virginia, Project Exile was implemented. And the results have been dramatic. What is Project Exile? It is a partnership between federal, state, and local law enforcement authorities to aggressively prosecute the illegal possession and use of guns by criminals. If you are a felon with a conviction, you will go to jail if you possess a gun. If you have been convicted of domestic abuse and you own a gun, you will go to jail. If you are a drug dealer with a gun, you will go to jail. And if you use drugs illegally, you will go to jail. These are federal laws that have been passed that with their aggressive enforcement under Project Exile have had dramatic results. These call for mandatory prison sentences, and the average sentences are 56 months, just shy of five years. Added to that stiff punishment is the fact that while awaiting trial, there is generally no bail. There is a presumption that you do not qualify for bail if you are arrested. And it's called Project Exile because if you are convicted in the city of Richmond under Project Exile for one of these crimes, you in fact are going to be exiled to a federal prison far away from your community and your friends and where you were threatening the public. Has it worked? The answer is absolutely yes. From 1998 to 19, uh, well, from 1997 to 1998, the homicide rate in Richmond dropped a precipitous 33 percent, and we are continuing to drive down the numbers this year. 656 guns have been removed from the hands of criminals. 405 individuals have been convicted, again, with an average sentence of 56 months. Why has it worked? It's really very simple. We have separated the criminals from their guns. We have then separated the criminals from their community. And we are aggressively reminding people through a very strong social marketing campaign that an illegal gun gets you five years in prison. The sign that you see on our table here this morning uh, is also a shrink wrap that exists on several major mass transit buses in the city of Richmond. Uh, we have reported, and you will hear from Deputy Chief Teresa Gooch, uh, a lot of um, incidents from the Richmond City Police where they are now arresting people for drug crimes and other crimes, and when they ask them if they have a gun, they say, are you kidding? I don't carry a gun in Richmond anymore because of that Project Exile. They have gotten the message. What has been our role in the Attorney General's office in the state of Virginia? Working with Helen Fahey and her staff, we have dedicated a full-time assistant attorney general to the U.S. Attorney's Office to prosecute these gun crimes. And it has been a remarkable uh, partnership. We have two of our prosecutors, our assistant attorney generals here with us this morning, Lisa McKeel and Richard Campbell, who have done an outstanding job working with the outstanding prosecutors in Ms. Fahey's office. We plan to continue that program and working with them in the future. Also, we've had tremendous support from the local Commonwealth attorneys. The Commonwealth attorney for the city of Richmond, David Hicks, has dedicated a full-time local prosecutor to work with the U.S. Attorney's Office. Both his prosecutor and mine have been sworn in as uh, by the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office to practice in their office. Our governor, recognized what all of you would recognize in a few short moments, and that is if this is working so well in the city of Richmond, why should not it be available to every county, city, and town in the state of Virginia, and for that matter, throughout the United States? Working under that presumption, the governor introduced basically Virginia exile, and it was passed by the legislature overwhelmingly at the beginning of this year. It was bipartisan, supported by Democrats, Republicans, and independents alike. And now in Virginia, we have laws that mirror and in some cases are tougher than the federal laws. Under Virginia exile, if you have a prior conviction for a violent felony and you're convicted of possessing a firearm, you will go to jail for a mandatory five years. If you're convicted of possessing a firearm on school property with the intent to use it 
or display it in a threatening manner, you will go to jail for five years. And if you're convicted of possessing a firearm with illegal drugs, you're looking at no less than five years in prison. We have taken a page out of the Project Exile that Helen Fahey uh, implemented in Richmond, and we have an aggressive social marketing program around the state. We now have signs on Interstate 64, 81, and 95 as you enter the state of Virginia advising everyone that an illegal gun in Virginia will get you a mandatory prison sentence. That is now the law in Virginia as of July 1, 1999. In short, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, uh, this kind of partnership with the federal, state, and local prosecutors and law enforcement authorities is having a dramatic effect. And it is having a dramatic effect for a very common sense reason, and that is we are saying to the criminals that if you possess a gun in any sense illegally, you will go to jail. And I think the results are indisputable, and it provides a model not only for other United States attorneys' offices around the nation, but certainly other attorney generals. I will be presenting next week uh, here in Washington to the other attorney generals and all of the heads of their criminal divisions uh, what we're doing in Virginia. Uh, the Attorney General of South Carolina, Charlie Condon, the Attorney General of Texas, John Cornyn, is implementing similar programs as we speak in their states, and we hope that we can get the cooperation of Attorney Generals nationwide to work with their U.S. attorneys to implement the same kind of partnership. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Early, and I'd now like to recognize uh, the United States Attorney for the Eastern District of Virginia. Uh, the Honorable Helen uh, Fahey, who has helped uh, lead uh, federal uh, efforts uh, in prosecution and also uh, in promoting Project Exile. You're re uh, first of all welcome and recognized. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, uh, distinguished members of the committee. It's a pleasure for me to be here before this committee. It's also a pleasure for me to be here in the company of two former United States attorneys. I'd like to, if it is acceptable to the committee, to deviate somewhat from my prepared statement, in part because I don't want to repeat uh, things that have already been said by both uh, witnesses and also by members of the committee. Without objection, your entire statement then will be made part of the record. Proceed. Thank you. And I would also like to ask that the entire statement of the Department of Justice be, pa be made Without part objection. of the record. Without Thank objection, you. so ordered. In 1997, when the United States Attorney's Office in the Eastern District of Virginia initiated Project Exile in Richmond, it was in response to a particular problem in a particular location. It was in response to the terrible homicide rate existing in Richmond at that time. I can assure each of you that when we started it, we had no idea what it would grow into and how it would be received across the country. We also really had no idea how extensive it would become, even in Richmond. The goal of Project Exile was to reduce gun violence by changing the culture in Richmond using a comprehensive multi-dimensional strategy. The strategy included law enforcement and prosecution efforts as well as community outreach and education programs. Project Exile is simple and straightforward in its execution and requires relatively limited prosecution and law enforcement resources. The message of Project Exile, an illegal gun gets you five years in federal prison, is clear, simple, and easy to understand. For gun-carrying criminals, the consequences have been swift, sure, and severe. For the citizens of Richmond, the results have been a safer community in which to live, work, and raise a family. As Attorney General Mark Early said, this has been a real partnership, a real cooperative effort. It has included all of the federal law enforcement agencies. It has included, obviously, the police department in the city of Richmond. It has also included the state police. It has included the elected prosecutor, David Hicks, in Richmond, as well as the federal prosecutors. It has involved members of the community, both the business community and the community at large. It has not been something that has just been a federal program. I won't go through the numbers of prosecutions except to say over 500 people have been indicted since the program began, and there have been almost 700 guns seized. 
One of the things that I really want to emphasize, because as we have gone along, I have come to realize how important it has been to the success of the program. I spent 17 years as a local prosecutor prior to becoming the United States Attorney. I was a prosecutor and then I was the elected prosecutor in Arlington, Virginia. I think we all know the message that we believed that our enforcement and prosecution of individuals was sending out to the community. The goals of prosecution were such things as punishment, rehabilitation, and deterrence. And deterrence. I think that we all felt, and maybe all of us in this business felt, that by prosecuting a certain individual for a certain crime, the message would get out to the community that it would not be a good idea for other individuals to commit those crimes. I think what Project Exile and what the media program part of Project Exile has done is gotten across to me and to many other people how important the message itself has been in creating the deterrence in the community and also in changing the culture of violence. One of the most important parts of it, I think, is to get the message out all over the city, the state, and the country that illegal possession of guns will no longer be tolerated. This has required in Richmond something that, except perhaps in the drug area and also drunk driving, has never been done in the law enforcement area, and that is to send out this clear message. It couldn't be sent out just by us in law enforcement for one reason, we didn't have the money. But it required a coalition of business, community, and church leaders some of the business organizations with the Retail Merchants Association and the Chamber of Commerce. The coalition operating as Project Exile Citizen Support Foundation has funded a creative advertising program, including TV and radio commercials, billboards, a city bus fully painted in black with a logo, an illegal gun gets you five years in federal prison, 15,000 business cards, which I noticed Congressman Barr has one up there, and various print advertising. The outreach program has been hugely successful, increasing citizen reports about guns and energizing the community to support police efforts. Through these efforts, hundreds of armed criminals have been removed from Richmond streets. Violent gangs responsible for many murders have been destroyed, and the rate of gun carrying by criminals has been cut. Officers now report drug dealers throwing down weapons before running instead of taking the risk of being caught with the weapons and a large number of homicides have been solved with information obtained from defendants in these cases. Most importantly, these efforts appear to be stemming the tide of violence. As others have said, homicides were down in 1998, 33% from 1997. So far this year, they are down an additional 29%. As a result, the citizens not only feel safer, but are safer. Because of the demonstrated results in Richmond, the United States Attorney's Office in the Eastern District of Virginia has expanded Project Exile to the Tidewater area of Virginia and is committed to continuing Project Exile as long as the need exists. In 1999, new legislation was passed in Virginia to make state laws more comparable to federal laws on bond and gun offenses. And we look forward to working with Richmond's Commonwealth Attorney as well as the other Commonwealth Attorneys in Virginia to have appropriate gun cases prosecuted in the local courts as opposed to the federal courts. Other cities have taken note of Project Exile's impact on the city of Richmond. The project model has been adopted in Rochester, Philadelphia, Oakland, Camden, Atlanta, New Orleans, Denver, the state of Texas, and other areas as well. Project Exile has proven that a comprehensive multi-dimensional strategy can work. With a little ingenuity, it can be very su a very successful tool in accomplishing one of the President's priorities, reducing the gun violence on our streets. But I would hope that Project Exile will not be v viewed just as a federal program or a program requiring just federal prosecution. It needs to be tailored to individual districts. I think what you're seeing in the state of Virginia is what we would expect to happen all over the country. We may start out with a program that is exclusively a federal program. We may then end up with changes in state laws to 
increase the penalties. And then we may have a program, which is where we expect Virginia will be, which will be both federal prosecution and state prosecution. But the message needs to be kept the same simple message that we have now, that an illegal gun will result in a substantial period of incarceration. Thank you. Thank you, and thank each of our witnesses uh, for their testimony. Let me start with a, a few questions uh, for our panelists. Uh, Mr. Heston, uh, you cited, and uh, let me, maybe you could uh, recite for the uh, subcommittee the fact uh, that uh, one city, Richmond, had more, was it federal gun uh, enforcement to prosecutions than the District of Columbia, California, and New Jersey, where there's several... Co and the district combined. Combined. Well, combined. Combined. Not just more than each of those, but more than the sum total of those cities. So, uh, through this uh, type of approach, uh, uh, and I think... Uh, I had them blow up uh, one of the one of, some of the information that was given to us, but the, this would coincide with your uh, with your figures of uh, prosecution of federal gun laws um, two in the district. And Mr. Holder, you said also uh, has basically uh, said that the the that he has no interest in the in the program, and that that. He is the U.S. attorney, isn't he, or was the U.S. attorney in the uh, district? What does he say? He was the U.S. attorney when did he? Was he the U.S. attorney when he made that statement? Yes, he was. He was. Yeah. Uh, our uh, attorney general in in the state of Virginia. Uh, was it you or the federal gov uh, federal agency, the U.S. Attorney's Office, that initiated the program? No, Project Exile was initiated in the U.S. Attorney's Office by Helen Fahey. Okay. Um, when I became Attorney General about 18 months ago, we met and talked, and um, Helen suggested a working relationship between our offices, and, and we were very open to that. We thought it was a great opportunity. And uh, the way we worked that out was simply by detailing an assistant attorney general from our office to the U.S. Attorney's Office. They were sworn in uh, as a, um, I'm not sure what the correct terminology, a deputy U.S. attorney or special assistant, special U.S. attorney to help prosecute So those. you provided two personnel uh, uh, from your staff who were sworn in and worked? Uh, Actually, we have provided one and the Commonwealth Attorney for the City of Richmond have provided one, and we have had two individuals serve in that capacity over the last 12 months. Uh, so uh, it was a federal initiative and uh, in cooperation with the, with the state. Uh, could you estimate, uh, Ms. Fahey, how much in resources this uh, costs uh, the Eastern District? Uh, is it, can you put any price tag on this as far as the the cost uh, for the program? I don't think I could put a price tag on it. I, I think that I could say from the point of view of attorney resources that we would estimate approximately three attorney resources, which includes the attorney from the attorney general's office as well as the Richmond Commonwealth Attorney's Office, and at least one full-time assistant United States attorney from my office, as well, obviously, as uh, support and uh, management type resources. Uh, the, the basic program, though, is being funded through uh, existing resources. Uh, there's no additional federal money coming into this uh, to support this or state. Uh, do you have an additional state appropriation uh, or is there a local uh, uh, contribution uh, towards financing the project? Maybe you could answer, uh, Attorney General. Mr. Chairman, Chairman from, from our perspective, what we did is um, we went through, as you know, each state has an agency which basically is the funnel for federal grant money. And we basically applied for a grant through the Department of Criminal Justice Services in Virginia uh, for a full-time attorney. Uh, and uh, so ours is being paid for by grant money. And um, if it were not, we would have done it anyway. But for our internal purposes, it allowed us to keep our 
resources intact and fund this prosecutor through a uh, grant from the state of Virginia, and it's been a very positive thing. I will also mention in terms of attorney resources, uh, one of the things to consider is personnel and the number. The other thing is the time and what you have to understand in most of these Project Exile cases is these cases generally don't go to trial. Uh, almost all of the defendants plead. You will generally have some preliminary motions, uh, but after that it's a, it's a relatively efficient uh, method of conviction. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, uh, Ms. Fahey, your organization has had no extra appropriation for this project, or have they from Department of Justice, or are you working out of existing uh, well, budget? We're working essentially out of existing resources, uh, although the Department of Justice did have attorneys detailed to our office at various times. But I would like to comment briefly because uh, uh, of some of the comments made uh, about Eric Holder, who is both my colleague and my uh, dear friend. He has been extremely supportive of Project Exile in Richmond from the very beginning. He attended numerous meetings with all of the federal law enforcement agencies to get them to put more resources in Richmond to work on the problem. He has helped get additional training money for the police department in Richmond so that they would be able to better deal with these types of cases and also to generally upgrade their general capabilities. You know why he hasn't uh, insisted on uh, initiating a program in Washington, D.C., which has had, uh, been plagued by incredible uh, violence? Well, um, I don't I certainly and don't. It has know. the tightest gun control laws, I think, in the nation. I mean, uh, it's almost impossible to own a farm. Hawaii fire. has more. Oh, well, I think, <laughs> I think though, when you look at those numbers, you ha you need to keep in mind that the United States Attorney in the District of Columbia controls both federal prosecution and also local prosecution. So they. But th it doesn't look like they've done either. No, but the they are. That's only federal <coughs> prosecution. Fe fe from federal, pro from a federal prosecutorial standpoint, uh, they haven't. That done only. Much. That does not include the cases that would have been prosecuted in superior court in the District of Columbia, because that would be. They would be the cases that would be prosecuted as violations of the D.C. law, not federal laws. Sure. Well. The statistics I have also from a chart that was given given me on federal prosecution show from 1993 basically to current time each year there's been a decrease in federal uh, prosecutions, uh, and uh, this is from whose testimony? This long, uh, who's in our second panel? Uh, we have both the graphic chart and then the numerical uh, display uh, showing from. Um, uh, 12,092 uh, criminal uh, referral prosec criminal referrals and that were prosecuted going from 12,000 down to 5,600 every year just about declining so, which concerns me finally uh, let me uh, just turn to mr. Heston for uh, last uh, question um, Thank you. Your, your organization, uh, NRA, um, has been criticized uh, because uh, of their stance on some gun control uh, legislation. Uh, we have a program here that's very successful, uh, and I want to know uh, what your organization, NRA, is doing uh, to uh, promote, encourage, uh, and foster a, a program that's uh, successful like this. Maybe you could comment. Uh, as uh, the NRA contributed early money to Project Exile and plan to continue, continue to do so. I would also like to seize this chance to speak to Ms. Fahey um, because uh, obviously this is not on your plate, but you're in the Department of Justice. Do you detect any kind of movement from the administration about providing the $50 million it will take to implement more extensively? 
We've heard silence, but no comment uh, one way or the other. I don't well, know. You, uh, I don't know. Might want to address the question to the chair, and I, I, I could your uh, just for protocol. Uh, would you like to respond, Miss? Uh, I don't know specifically what the state of the budget is. The last thing that I heard was that all of our budgets might be cut by uh, one percent. I assume that that would mean that there would not be additional resources for any of us to prosecute gun cases. And one of the versions of the budget that I saw had a number of earmarks for some districts to prosecute additional gun cases, which might mean for a district like mine that I would actually lose resources. I believe that was 1% of the uh, increase, proposed increases. Uh, but let me yield at this uh, point to the uh, gentlelady from Hawaii, Mrs. Mink. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> the uh, complete testimony <clears throat> which you have submitted, uh, uh, Ms. Fay, <clears throat> I think uh, parts of it really need to be <clears throat> uh, looked at in this context of uh, what we are discussing. There's an implication by the questions and statements that have been made thus far that uh, the federal government has been less than enthusiastic in um, prosecuting uh, the uh, violent crimes committed with firearms. And the charts are pointed to as illustrative of the <coughs> uh, lessened uh, commitment by the federal government. But as I read your testimony, it indicates that overall, the country has experienced a very sharp decline in violent crimes uh, committed with firearms. Is that a correct uh, That is correct. My, under my understanding is that gun violence nationwide is down approximately 35 percent since 1992. So that the prosecutions would also uh, be reduced by that percentage at the least if there are less crimes being committed. Uh, during that period. Is that a correct I think all, assumption? I, I think all of us would hope that the end result would be that there would be fewer violent criminals out there for us to prosecute. How, the charts that the chairman just referred to, how would you uh, comment on the, on the figures if, if they're true that the federal government is not uh, sharpening its emphasis on violent crimes with guns and whether the uh, charts are correct in the inference that seems to be cast here that the federal government is lessening its interest in prosecutions. Well, I'm not, I'm not sure which chart um, Congressman Barr has in front of him, and I don't think I could possibly uh, see that far. But I would like to comment on one thing, because I am not suggesting, and I don't think anyone suggest, would suggest, that the drop in homicides in the city of Richmond is totally attributable to Project Exile. It certainly is not. It's attributable to many factors. A lot of good work by the police department, a lot of work in the community, many, many factors. I believe very strongly that Project Exile was a significant factor and a very significant factor in opening the door and allowing other things to go on in the city. But even in the city of Richmond, Project Exile is not the only thing that the United States Attorney's Office was doing to deal with the problem of violent crime. We have taken out dozens and dozens of violent drug dealers from the streets of the city of Richmond, people who were committing multiple homicides in Richmond. That is being done all over the country in every United States Attorney's Office. That was the priority of the President. It was a priority of the Attorney General. The first thing that we were asked to look at when we became United States Attorneys was what can we do to reduce violent crime in this country? And there is no one single thing. And I, that is true even in the city of Richmond, even from a federal perspective. My assumption when the uh, federal government embarks, uh, as you have done, on a uh, unique program and uh, tests out a particular theory, as your department has, on very, very uh, strict enforcement of federal laws that already exist, that this is done with the hope that it would stimulate 
uh, throughout the country, similar emphasis by other uh, U.S. attorneys and in other collaborative efforts with local communities. If that is the case, then, would you say that it was that type of approach that led to other communities like um, uh, Philadelphia and others that have been mentioned here in, in embarking upon similar programs to connect uh, federal enforcement together with uh, much stronger and greater local and state efforts? Well, I, I think that's absolutely true. And we did not begin this as a program that we thought should be a national program. We started it in response to a particular problem. As it started to get, well, as it started to appear that the program was successful and perhaps a good idea for other areas to adopt, I think we have seen that in other areas of the country. So would you measure the success of Project Exile in the number of replications that you have in other districts by other U.S. attorneys collaborating with other state attorney generals and trying to emphasize uh, local enforcement rather than a takeover of law enforcement by the federal government? I think every district has to look at its own particular problems, its own state laws, its own local and federal resources, and determine what type of a program would work best in that jurisdiction. But I feel very, very strongly that there should be strict enforcement of gun laws, whether it is done federally or whether it is done at the local offices, and there should be a very, very clear message sent out. I have just one final question to the Attorney General uh, Early. Uh, do you feel, uh, Mr. Early, that based upon the new laws that have been enacted in Virginia, that according to your testimony are not comparable to the federal laws, that there will come a time when the state of Virginia will be able to take over this project exile and fully implement it uh, as part of the uh, governmental responsibilities of the state of Virginia. I hope it will always remain a partnership. I think that is what has been the very successful dynamic in the city of Richmond, and I think it's what will be the successful dynamic for the state. You know, the fact of the matter is that in America, we do have different levels of law enforcement and prosecution. We do have federal laws and federal prosecutors. We have state laws and state prosecutors. And we need to play to our strengths. And we have some very, very tough federal laws on criminals possessing guns. In many instances, they are tougher than many state and local laws. And I think the beauty of Project Exile is if you can uh, have the kind of leadership we had with Helen Fahey in Richmond in having the federal prosecutors take the lead, it is an extraordinary catalyst in then forming a partnership with state and local prosecutors. There is no question that the federal leadership on Project Exile in Richmond was a catalyst for a change in state laws statewide in the, in the Commonwealth of Virginia. What is happening now in the city of Richmond after only three months of now having our new state Virginia exile laws is that the Commonwealth attorney for the city of Richmond, David Hicks, confers with the U.S. attorney and our prosecutors in their office about each particular gun case. And the question is asked, who will prosecute this case? And oftentimes the criteria is based on where we think we can get the most severe sentence. Um, any kind of homicide rate in any city is a tragedy. And I think what we have been able to demonstrate in Richmond with this partnership, uh, and Helen's right, it's not simply one thing, but I don't think you can underestimate the power of getting criminals who carry guns off the street. And if we can determine the most effective means of prosecuting those and getting them separated from the community for the longest time, uh, we're going to all be better off, and I think the results in Richmond have shown that. If the uh, federal laws on gun possession are uh, uh, so successful in reducing the uh, felonies committed by these criminals, why would not uh, the state of Virginia not want to replicate the severity of the federal laws in its own laws? 
We have. That's what the Virginia Exile Program that was passed last year is. So it's, fair, it's basically comparable. It's very similar. Uh, there are a few differences here and there, and um, in some cases, you know, the, prose the prosecutorial uh, efforts at the federal level uh, we think can still be more effective. Uh, you know, this is called Project Exile because it gets criminals who carry guns out of the community. It gets them off of the street very quickly. And one of the things that the federal program will always have as an advantage is the ability to place people in prisons that are far away from their communities. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the uh, gentlelady from Hawaii. Is on? Um, and again, I want to thank all. Yes, Mr. Heston. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to make one comment. While the NRA is proud, uh, very proud of our involvement in Project Exile in the Richmond and now in Georgia, last year, we, uh, with the vigorous help of Mayor Rendell, and Senator Specter managed to get at the beginning of such a program in the city of Philadelphia, which also has a huge crime rate. I, I would, uh, I would, I won't say challenge, but I would differ with, uh, with Ms. Fahey in saying that um, passing gun laws will help solve crime. Passing gun laws is almost a complete failure. We have 22,000 gun laws on the books in the United States. The prosecution rate, the arrest rate is pretty good. Prosecution rate is practic practically zero. To give a significant example, in the past little more than two years, 6,000, 6,000 young students, meaning not children, but not adults, have been arrested for carrying firearms on a school campus in almost every municipality. That is now the law, and properly, that is a good law. Of those 6,000, over the last two years, there have been 10 prosecutions, 10 out of 6,000. The federal government must take in hand the problem of prosecuting arrested criminals. It's just simply the whole structure can fall apart on that simple problem. In other words, it isn't the passage of gun laws that stops well, that, crime, that, it's nothing. the enforcement of gun laws that stops crime. As, with all respect to the honorable uh, gentlewoman from Hawaii, um, Hawaii, and it is a marvelously effective example, Hawaii has the most stringent gun control laws in America very po uh, possibly in the world. You have to register ammunition for a gun in Hawaii. And the tragic incident a day before yesterday demonstrates that that doesn't help things. It's, it's a nice placebo kind of. You can suck your thumb and say, well, we've got all these gun laws, that maybe we should pass a couple more. That would do it, wouldn't it? It won't do it. Prosecuting criminals, that's what made Mayor Giuliani's uh, boast, his, determined, his determination to reduce crime in the city of New York. That's how that worked, prosecuting criminals. We, we have a vote. Uh, Mr. Heston, I know you have uh, an engagement with another very distinguished American, uh, former Secretary of Defense Weinberger, uh, and uh, we would excuse you. Uh, thank you for your testimony today. It's an honor to have you here. Uh, appreciate it very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, honorable ladies and gentlemen, and fellow citizens. Thank you, Mr. Heston. Uh, Mr. Early and Ms. Fahey, would you all be able to wait just a few minutes so I can go vote very quickly, and then we'll come back and uh, reconvene? I'd be happy to. Thank you. We're in recess until uh, we reconvene after this vote on the floor.
we could, I would like to go ahead and call the uh, subcommittee back to order. If we could have uh, the two witnesses who are remaining from our first uh, panel, Attorney General Mark uh, Early and uh, United States Attorney Helen Fahey, uh, please uh, return. What I'd like to do, uh, I believe uh, we're, we were going to try to uh, proceed during the vote, and uh, unfortunately, Monday, some of us uh, missed uh, some votes uh, through uh, airplane mechanical problems, so uh, we're all trying to keep our voting record as high as we can, but we do want to keep the uh, hearing moving and proceed with the witnesses. I had some questions that I did not uh, I get to in my first round, and uh, when Mr. Barr, our vice chairman, returns, uh, we'll yield to him and then any other members as they return uh, from votes on the floor. Um, one, of the, one of the questions uh, that I wanted to ask uh, in regard to Project Exile that you described, Mr. Attorney General, was that uh, you were transitioning uh, to proje from Project uh, Exile to uh, project uh, Virginia Exile, and uh, uh, you said that uh, it was necessary to uh, or to uh, also have the state pass uh, laws. Uh, I, I believe some of those were implemented in Virginia or passed uh, in June uh, of this uh, past year. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about the transition and? Uh, now, will we look to see uh, more uh, state prosecutions as a, opposed to federal prosecutions? What, what, what was the transition, and then what, what are we going to see? Well, I think, first of all, it's important to understand the context that the, the Project Exile that came out of the U.S. Attorney's uh, Office under uh, Helen Fahey's leadership was targeted at the city of Richmond. Um, we, we have a big state in Virginia. We have, you know, over 160 various uh, jurisdictions. We have uh, local prosecutors in each of those jurisdictions that are independently elected. And it obviously would be, uh, I think, unreasonable to expect the U.S. Attorney's Office to prosecute gun crimes in every jur local jurisdiction uh, throughout the United States. I think the kind of approach that needs to be taken is what happened in Richmond, and that is to target the major cities, where you have a presence of a U.S. Attorney's Office and good resources and tackle where we have some of these really high out-of-control homicide rates where people just, you know, are carrying guns for, with criminal intent on a regular basis. But in Virginia, we, we said, look, this thing is so effective at reducing the homicide rate, we want our prosecutors to be able to have this ability in every jurisdiction, whether it's the city of Virginia Beach, the city of Roanoke, the county of Fairfax. This ought to work everywhere, and we have prosecutors everywhere. So the idea was to take these, um, this, this tough ability to separate guns from criminals and to put criminals away for a very definitive long period of time that we thought we ought to be able to emulate around the Commonwealth of Virginia. So Virginia Exile was never envisioned as a way to replace the efforts in the U.S. Attorney's Office of Project Exile in Richmond and down in Norfolk. There's still going to be, I believe, a very strong need for that, and that's why we continue to have our partnership with them in those cities, but we also want to have our citizens be able to have the protection and the benefit of that kind of law enforcement in every jurisdiction. My other uh, question was for uh, Ms. Fahey. Uh, you did undertake this project as an initiative within the U.S. Attorney's Office through existing resources. Uh, and obviously that was a, a subjective uh, determination that was made uh, by you and your department. Isn't it possible for others to also uh, institute through existing resources uh, uh, adoption of Project Exile uh, and focus it on areas where you have uh, high uh, incidence of crime and uh, uh, use of illegal weapons? Well, um, as I'm sure you know, the President gave a directive to the Justice Department, which was given to all United States attorneys, that each office was to develop a gun violence reduction initiative, and that is being finalized at the present time. 
Many offices. When was that uh, issued? Excuse me? When was that issued? Uh, perhaps April of this year. And it still isn't finalized? Well, that doesn't mean people aren't doing their, um, aren't doing things in their district. They are. They are finalizing the papers that have gone into the Justice Department. But they had a meeting uh, within the last two days at the National Advocacy Center down in South Carolina of all of the uh, gun enforcement coordinators okay. in the, in the, from every United States Attorney's Office in the country to discuss the programs that every single district has. So well, I'd like to our staff to get a copy of the directive and then maybe we could get an inventory of where we are since that was April and we're now uh, uh, approaching the end of the year and maybe we can see uh, where the Department of Justice is on this initiative. I did want to continue the hearing. Mr. Barr was about to uh, start questions. I'll recognize him and then we'll go to uh, Mr. Turner. Mr. Thank Barr. You, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm sorry. I again want to uh, commend your office and you personally, Ms. Fahey, and those that work under you, and including uh, Mr. David Schiller, uh, who was, I know, one of the leading attorneys to begin Project Exile in uh, your office uh, for your work. Uh, I do wish we would see a little more support from, from Maine Justice uh, and from the Attorney General and Deputy Attorney General for, for this project. I think that the Attorney General and the Deputy could provide tremendous leadership uh, in, in this instance and really help other jurisdictions. Uh, I think that uh, the Deputy Attorney General's choice of words was unfortunate, uh, as has been alluded to earlier and as he was quoted in the New York Times of February 10th of this year, calling this a cookie-cutter approach somewhat derogatorily. Uh, and uh, another uh, justice official, uh, Kent Marcus, uh, last year in August quoted in the Wall Street Journal as uh, dismissing Project Exile uh, as an assembly line prosecution. Uh, now, while I, I certainly understand being a former U.S. attorney myself and as uh, Mr. Hutchison also being a former U.S. attorney uh, indicated in his opening remarks, and as I know you understand, uh, one of the great strengths of U.S. attorney's offices is they have a great deal of flexibility in terms of prosecutorial discretion and how to use the resources in their offices, and that is something that has always been the strength of our United States attorney system. Uh, but by the same token, if there are projects and programs that work, uh, you know, let's use them. Uh, and you know, even a cookie cutter, if it produces good cookies, uh, is something that's worthwhile. And even an assembly line, if it produces a good car, is worthwhile. Uh, and I think back uh, to my days as a U.S. attorney, one of the still today, I believe, most successful uh, anti-crime programs in the history of our Department of Justice is the OCDEF program, the Organized Crime Drug Enforcement Task Force approach instituted in the early 1980s uh, by President Reagan and continued by every president and every uh, uh, attorney general since then. And OCDEF, very similar to uh, Project Exile, except on a, on a much broader scale uh, because it was directed from uh, from Maine Justice and U.S. attorneys across the country, including in the 13 core cities, were required to institute it and be a part of it, uh, did, I think, ex exactly uh, what Project Exile is supposed to do. And, and I, I read from uh, the uh, Project Exile uh, pamphlet that you all have put out, uh, and it, it includes uh, four basic aspects or basic components of, of Project Exile. Uh, and I'll paraphrase here, uh, full coordination uh, from the officer on the beat up to and including the federal prosecutor, uh, full coordination with the uh, state officials, uh, the attorney general's office uh, and the uh, uh, commonwealth's attorney's offices, uh, active coordination of all police agencies, uh, a simplified uh, reporting system, and number four, coordinated use of innovative and aggressive policing methods. The common term in each one of those four components or aspects of Project Exile and, and why it works is the word coordination. Uh, and it does somewhat mystify me uh, why some of your colleagues at Maine Justice uh, seem to take umbrage and denigrate a coordinated approach to law enforcement. That's all Exile really is at its core. It's simply a decision by the prosecuting authorities uh, to better coordinate in a very conscious way uh, the resources and the process of, of 
investigating uh, and prosecuting certain types of crime. Uh, and it works. Uh, and and I, I, I really am mystified, particularly in a day when perhaps there's frequently far too much criticism of all sorts of different programs, that we're going to the Department of Justice and saying, here's, a, here's an approach that works. Please use it elsewhere. We will give you the money for it. We want you to do it. And what we get back is sort of the high hat saying, oh, that's a cookie cutter approach or that's an assembly line approach and we, we don't want to, to replicate it. Uh, and I think also some of the arguments uh, that there aren't enough resources, and we'll get into this I think a little bit more with, with uh, the next panel, uh, are a little bit disingenuous by people up here in Washington as well. Uh, now, I know that we had some discussion during a previous uh, question about uh, a proposed 1 percent cut in an increase in, in agencies' budgets. The fact of the matter is, though, there has been just over the past five years a 50 percent increase in ATF's budget uh, from 385 uh, uh, million to almost 600 million. Uh, and in the justice uh, budget as well, there has been over that same five-year period from 95 to 99 uh, also a 50 percent increase in the budget. So I really don't think that arguments that there simply isn't at Maine Justice enough money to do these things uh, really flies with the tremendous increases that uh, in budgets that have been afforded Department of Justice and ATF and U.S. Attorney's offices. And I would just implore you to use what influence you might have uh, with the Attorney General and with the Deputy Attorney General to, first of all, maybe just in a very kind way, ask them not to use those sorts of terms in describing a project that works tremendously well uh, and urge them to direct more resources uh, to U.S. Attorney's offices, particularly, as Mr. Early has said also, in, in major cities where we obviously have problems of violent crime and the use of firearms. Uh, so that there is simply a better coordinated approach all the way up and down the line uh, and a better coordinated process. I mean, that's, that's, again, at its core what Project Exile does. I can't imagine that anybody, and if either of you disagree with it, certainly tell me, uh, finding uh, fault with an approach that simply says coordinate at all levels of prosecution and investigation, coordinate the reporting process and streamline it, uh, and coordinate every aspect of these. It's worked in OSADEF with drug cases. It's worked with the organized crime strike forces going back to uh, Attorney General Kennedy's days. It works with Project Exile. Uh, so for heaven's sake, please, whatever you all can do, to urge the administration to use this program to direct that other major city U.S. attorney's offices use it uh, would, I think, be deeply appreciated, not by just those of us in Congress, but by the people in those cities, such as the citizens of Richmond, who I, I know from hearing from many of them, deeply appreciate uh, the efforts of your two offices and the, uh, the police department uh, in Richmond. So thank you very much, and, and I do hope that you will assist us in that effort. Thank the gentleman from uh, Georgia. Recognize the uh, gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Tierney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I regret the fact that Mr. Heston apparently had to leave. Your mic on. One of them was, I guess. Uh, I regret the fact that Mr. Heston apparently had to leave in our absence. I, uh, I do that only because I think that uh, we caught Moses in a misstatement there. Before he left, he was going to present to us all the things we agreed upon and leave the things we disagree off, and then proceeded. Uh, to do just the opposite. Uh, so I had wanted to have the opportunity to share with him some of the administration's figures on uh, fighting uh, crime and prosecuting crime that uh, he should be, and I suspect probably is, knowledgeable of. Uh, and I think there's been a good two-step process here where substantial federal resources have been given to prevent the access to firearms by prohibited persons and to incarcerate violent gun offenders, and I think that's uh, been successful. And we've also had these partnerships that we're talking about with the various state and local authorities. I'm a little bit concerned about the federalization of all crimes or whatever. I, I've always thought that a good deal of the law enforcement uh, was particular to the states uh, and that their resources were appropriately put on that way. I was interested to, uh, to see a statement by uh, John Justice, who's the president of the National District Attorneys Association, who essentially uh, says just that, that about 90% of the crimes in the United States, including uh, gun laws, are prosecuted by the 3,000 or so lo local prosecutors, and that's the way it should be. Uh, that the federal uh, has, government has about 100 U.S. attorneys, and uh, they're stretched pretty thin, and, and they can probably assist and help out on that, but it would seem appropriate, and I'd like your comments on the idea of why are we turning this on its head and trying to 
uh, push this towards the federal government when, in fact, it seems that it's very appropriate for states to, in fact, undertake the prosecution of the majority of these crimes and, uh, and the state to have the laws. If they want to toughen up their laws to have it illegal, a uh, gun get you five years in a state prison or whatever, they're certainly capable of doing that and then using their resources to prosecute. Either one of you want to touch on that? I'll, I'll be happy to, to go first. You know, as with most things in life, this is not an either-or proposition. Um, it's, it's both and. The fact of the matter is it was a policy decision on the part of the United States Congress to pass a number of these tough gun laws a long time ago. Uh, most of these gun laws that are being prosecuted under Project, Project Exile were passed by the Congress in the late 60s. And but I guess what I'm saying is there's nothing to stop the state. I mean, you're all in here tough on this, and, and you like the law, apparently. You want to enforce it and bang around on it. So what's holding back the states, so many of whom have surpluses, and, and a number of prosecutors from going out there, passing these tough laws, and prosecuting under state law? Well, I think you'll see that uh, we hope that they follow uh, the lead of Governor Gilmore in the state of Virginia in passing similar kinds of laws and enforcing them. But, I guess that's not what I'm hearing here. I'm hearing you, that you want the federal government to step up and do the work for you, you know? Well, with all due respect, I think it's a question of simply recognizing that everybody has a role in this. Um, it doesn't make any sense to me uh, for anyone to suggest that the federal government shouldn't prosecute the laws it has passed, nor does it make any sense to me for anyone to suggest that the states shouldn't be aggressively involved in prosecuting their gun laws and well, no, see, no, tougher. Let's not go there. Nobody made that statement. We certainly think the state should be aggressively enforcing their laws, and that's what I'm talking about, that they should, that they have far more in, in line of resources to do just that than the, than the federal government apparently does uh, to, you know, with 100 or so uh, U.S. attorneys that they have. So I do think it's a cooperative effort, but I'm wondering where we're putting the emphasis on this and why the states aren't stepping up uh, and enforcing these types of laws and having some federal assistance on this, but, uh, but maybe doing more of it. The other side of that is that, you know, you look and you do a prosecutor on the federal end, of course, the, uh, the people that are convicted then end up in a federal prison. Uh, and in Richmond, as, as one of the used, uh, recent uh, district court judges, federal district court judges recently noted, uh, they end up in a federal prison very close to Richmond, leaving the state prisons uh, so freed up that they're able to then rent space in them to the federal government. So again, everybody's tapping into the federal resources there, and, and I wonder if, you know, what we're doing here. Well, I think what we're doing is implementing what's always been true in the American uh, prosecutorial system, and that's prosecuting the laws at every level. And um, I think what has been uh, unique about Project Exile at the federal level is um, there is, for whatever reason, historically, a tremendous deterrent effect on the criminal element about the fact they would, could potentially be prosecuted under federal law. And you don't think it, there'd be such a deterrent effect if you had a similar state law as you do in Virginia? You don't think that has the same effect? I would hope that it does, but I think historically you can't discount the ability of federal prosecutions in certain major areas like organized crime and significant drug conspiracies and drug dealing as well as violent gun crime to have a very, very potent effect. And when but, you combine that... But are we not that, to, in, to really concentrate our federal resources on just that, the categories that you just spoke, and leave the other, you know, crimes, uh, including your, your garden variety crimes with the possession of a handgun, to the states to prosecute and to imprison on that basis? And I think that's a point well made, that if you want to really use the best resources in combination, then you take the scarcer federal resources for this purpose and concentrate them on the more egregious crimes, and then you have the, the prosecutors at the state level undertake the responsibility for the others. Well, at least I know in Richmond, you know, we consider the high homicide re rate we had to be very egregious. And I think if you look at what concerns And I understand that that's exactly why the U.S. Attorney's Office went in in that particular instance. So if right. you were telling me that you want to have the federal government play a major role in those areas in this country where it's an egregious problem, it seems to be a different message than the one that I heard, which was you wanted to, to jump in and federalize it right across the board. But I think that there'd be more room for discussion on that. Well, you might have been out of the room. You didn't hear me say that. I think the suggestion that we've had on this panel unanimously is that these ought to be targeted in areas of the United States where you have a significant problem of gun homicides and homicides in general, which are going to be large major metropolitan areas. And Project Exile is very well suited to be prosecuted 
through the U.S. Attorney's offices in those areas, particularly with the cooperation and partnership like we have in Virginia with the state and local authorities. I would just like to respond briefly. I don't think anyone, certainly uh, not, uh, not me, has suggested that all of these crimes be prosecuted federally or that all they, these crimes be federalized across the country. It would not be wise and it is not feasible. When we started Project Exile in Richmond, it was a response to a tragic level of violence in the city. It was a feeling that something needed to be done and perhaps we could use the federal system effectively to deal with the problem or to make a difference. And uh, we could have spent a lot of time sitting around talking about what other people could or should do about the problem. But we decided as a group instead to decide what we could do about the problem in a cooperative manner and came up with what was initially exclusive federal prosecution. But one of the things that the success of Project Exile did was to encourage the state to change the state laws so that they were more comparable to the federal laws so that more of these cases could be prosecuted in the state. And my understanding is that is taking place in other parts of the country as well as the general message, which is vigorous enforcement of gun laws, whether it be state or federal, gets across to the community and to the criminals. Are you now finding that your office is shifting more of the prosecutions over to the state resources? Well, we, the, the law just went into effect one July, so we are just beginning that process, but we are going to do it in a cooperative manner. We're going to sit down and look at every single case and decide where it would be best prosecuted for a variety of reasons. What are the other reasons besides the resource allocation? Well, there may be individuals that uh, we think are linked, for instance, to a, uh, a drug gang that we want to keep in federal court for uh, uh, because they, we may want their cooperation for something. People who've been involved in other types of crimes which are federal, people who have guns but are also uh, uh, distributing large quantities of narcotics, those types of things. So that if I'm following you, then you want to really keep the more egregious cases, the, one, the ones that might be of multiple different uh, offenses or whatever, some of them being heavily yes. federal oriented in your football court, but then shift over the larger gun-related crimes to the state prosecution where... We expect eventually that... Well, another example, though, is under federal law, someone convicted of domestic violence who is in possession of, of a gun can be prosecuted. My uh, understanding is that that is not yet possible under state law, so it will not always be a major drug dealer. It may be some other types of situations as well. But I think that we work together so well with all of our colleagues in law enforcement and in prosecution and in the Attorney General's office that we will come up with the most effective way to handle these cases. And I don't think there's ever been a suggestion on the state side that they should, we should do these cases just, well, so they don't have to pay for them. That's never been the state's goal. I think everyone looked at it as people are being murdered every day on the streets of the city of Richmond. And we all have an obligation to do what we can at a particular time. And that's what we did. And I think we really have helped the city. We have helped the citizens of the city of Richmond. We have made their lives much, much better, much safer. And that's very important to all of us. Uh, I think you've done a, a good deed there. And again, I think that the states are perfectly capable of taking some of this initiative, particularly after seeing the example of what happened there under the leadership of the federal uh, involvement, but I, I'm still not convinced that the federal government has to take the lead and be that involved in every situation that the states can't look at the model of what you've done and start to take some initiative on their own in different situations and then allocate it down under the normal uh, participatory rate between the federal uh, focusing on the more egregious crimes and the state uh, focusing on the others. Thank I think you. that has happened in places. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank the gentleman. Uh, now I'd like to recognize the gentlelady from Illinois, Ms. Schenkowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank the witnesses. Um, I am concerned about who has the discretion, what individuals have the discretion to divert cases from state to federal courts, and I'm looking at U.S. versus Jones, where the court itself expresses 
that um, its concern about the discretion afforded individuals who divert cases from state to federal court for prosecution, um, witnesses from the offices of both the Commonwealth's attorney and U.S. attorney were unable to detail the specific process by which this review and diversion occurs. A local police officer is apparently individually responsible for this task. And that does concern me. I wondered if you wanted to respond to that, if, if in fact it is individual police officers who ultimately have that discretion. No, I don't think I would describe it that way. Uh, the individual police officer who makes the stop on the street, for example, is the one who begins the process. When he finds a gun, he calls the ATF to find out whether or not the circumstances of that particular case would qualify for pro federal prosecution and whether there is sufficient evidence in that case. Will that happen in every single case involving a gun? Yes. So they don't... Yes. Filter out. No. Mm -hmm. No. I mean, one of the, it, it is, it's being done in every case in part so that there will be no discrimination. Well, why is it then that the court raised that concern and, and found that? I, I'm, well, I know that Judge Williams, who wrote that opinion, has a, believes very strongly that these types of cases should be prosecuted in state court and not in federal court for largely philosophical reasons. And so he has objected on a number of grounds to the uh, project. Well, one of the reasons I believe that was given is that 90% of the project exile defendants are African Americans, and the court noted that the inability to explain the procedure used, quote, cast some doubt on the assertion that race plays no role in deciding whether a particular case is to be federally prosecuted. So that was the concern that... Uh, First of all, there was no finding by the court that there was any evidence of discrimination. No finding whatever by the court. So a lot of discussion, but no finding. But let me talk a little bit about the numbers, because I think that creates a distortion. What is not mentioned in there is that almost somewhere between 85 and 90 percent of the homicide victims in the city of Rick Richmond are African American. It is that particular segment of the society in Richmond that is being most victimized by the gun-carrying criminals. When I've been, I've, I've been a prosecutor for a long time, one of the complaints for many, many years was that law enforcement did not take crime against minorities as seriously as it did crimes against whites. Have we have looked at the situation in Richmond. We have looked at who was being killed. And if you look at crime statistics, and they're not just in Richmond, they're all over the country. Most homicides are committed within a particular race. Most murders, the vast majority of murders of African Americans are committed by African Americans. The most, the vast majority of murders of whites are committed by whites. There is not anywhere near as high an interracial aspect to that as many people think. Can I interrupt you for one sure. second then? Then why shouldn't Richmond juries that also reflect that population be those that decide in those cases. In other words, they would also reflect the population of Richmond and might more accurately reflect, uh, be juries of peers of those individuals. Well, we started the program because there was a homicide problem and it was getting worse, it wasn't getting better. It appeared to be related to criminals carrying guns, drug dealers with guns. The prosecutor's office in the city of Richmond, in part because of the overwhelming level of crime in the city, did not have the resources to give the attention to these types of crimes as they needed to have to have them effectively prosecuted. 
If you take an office like in the city of Richmond that has a total of 30 prosecutors and you have 110, 130, 160 homicides a year, plus rapes, plus armed robberies, plus burglaries, they do not have the resources to, to put on these types of what you might call status cases. Okay, well, let me, let me express my concern here. The jury pool for Richmond itself is about 75 percent African American. The jury pool for the Richmond Division of the Eastern Division of Virginia is drawn from a broader geographical area and is, in contrast, about 10 percent African American. If you're saying that 90, 85 or 90 percent of the cases involve African Americans, it would seem to me that if we're trying to establish a jury of peers, that it might be fair. And it does, it does concern me that we're talking about this concentration of one racial group um, in, in terms of those that are brought to federal court. First of all, the jury composition in Richmond had absolutely nothing to do with where these cases were prosecuted. Absolutely nothing. The police chief in the city of Richmond is African American. The elected prosecutor in the city of Richmond is African American. Both of them have been heavily involved and totally supportive of this program. I don't think if we look at the country nationwide that there is any way that we could say that any United States Attorney's Office sh should not prosecute a case if their jury pool would be different from the jury pool in one of the cities in which they were prosecuting cases. It is ju would just be an absolute impossibility. In addition to that, the vast majority of these people plead guilty. They are not jury trials. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank the gentlelady. Uh, do any of the other members have any additional questions? Yes, I, I have a... Mrs. Bank. Okay, a uh, question. <clears throat> there has been... Uh, uh, comments made and questions asked about the uh, lackadaisical attitude of the Department of Justice and uh, the leadership of the department with respect to uh, coming to grips with uh, their responsibility to take the lead on matters affecting um, uh, crimes caused uh, crimes using a, uh, a gun or firearms. And uh, I wanted to just note that <clears throat> staff has given me a report issued by the U.S. Department of Justice called Promising Strategies to Reduce Gun Violence. And I wanted to ask uh, uh, Ms. Fay if she was familiar with this report or contributed to it or... I am. I, I'm, I, I'm not familiar in detail with all of the things that are in it. But you are familiar with the report? Yes, I am. It was issued in February of 1999. And do you think it just, it accurately describes the overall efforts being made to reduce gun violence and that it uh, <clears throat> illustrates the importance of the Department of Justice gives to this whole uh, question of uh, federal, state, and local responsibility to do something about guns in their communities. Well, I think that that uh, particular publication outlines all of the programs that uh, had been initiated uh, probably prior to the last year, year and a half, and since then additional programs uh, aimed at reducing gun violence have been initiated in United States Attorney's offices throughout the country. Now, in the uh early pages of this report, profile number two, it discusses at great length the Boston strategy to prevent uh, gun violence. Are you familiar with the uh, Boston situation? To some it extent, It apparently I am. precedes that of Richmond. I am to some extent, yes. Yes, and do you think that program has been effective? And, and to what extent did the federal government uh, <clears throat> become involved in the initiation and prosecution of that project? Um, I don't know when the federal government became involved in it. I know that it, it was a uh, major effort for various segments of, uh, of the law enforcement community and society and various agencies in Boston. 
Uh, throughout this report, there is an indication that <clears throat> the uh, administration has been well into um, urging and promoting promising strategies to reduce gun violence, and many of the reports deal with projects that began in 1992 and carried on until the present time. So, Mr. Chairman, in view of the fact that there's been so much criticism about the administration's lack of interest in prosecuting uh, the uh, matter of gun violence, I ask unanimous consent that this report be placed into the record at this point. Without objection, the uh, Thank you. report will be cited uh, in the record. Mr. Barr? Well, uh, I want to take this opportunity to thank uh, both of the remaining uh, two panelists, uh, the Attorney General and the uh, United States Attorney uh, from the Eastern District of Virginia to uh, uh, express my appreciation for your coming forward, for your leadership on this uh, project. We hope that it can be replicated uh, not only throughout uh, Virginia but throughout the United States because we're all looking for successful uh, uh, answers and solutions to the problem that we have uh, with uh, gun violence and stopping uh, crime and um, other problems that we've had uh, in our streets, in our communities, our schools and neighborhoods. So we'll, we will uh, again say thank you and excuse you at this time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to call our second panel uh, this morning. Second panel consists of two witnesses, uh, Ms. Uh, Teresa Gooch, who's the Deputy uh, Chief of Police for the Richmond Bureau of Police. Uh, the second uh, witness is Professor Susan Long, and uh, Professor Long is co-director of the Transactional Records Access Clearinghouse with Syracuse University, and I believe her study uh, was referred to uh, in this uh, first panel. I want to welcome both of our witnesses, and again, uh, remind you that this is an Investigations uh, and Oversight Subcommittee of the uh, House of Representatives. Uh, we do swear in our witnesses, and uh, you will be under oath when you testify. And uh, we also will ask you to limit uh, your remarks to five minutes and uh, request that any lengthy statements or documents uh, be submitted for the record through unanimous consent. You are standing. Would you please uh, raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give before this subcommittee of Congress is the whole truth and nothing but the truth. I do. Witnesses answered in the affirmative, and we're pleased to have you both uh, with us today. Uh, we've heard a little bit about uh, how Project Exile was instituted um, in uh, and for Richmond. And uh, we're pleased to recognize at this time uh, Teresa Gooch, who's the Deputy Chief of Police uh, with the Richmond Bureau of Police. And I'm sure you'll be able to provide us with more uh, information and background relating to your success story. Uh, welcome and you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the uh, committee. I would like to take a brief moment to introduce you also to two officers that have accompanied me here, Sergeant Norris L. Evans and Officer Douglas Vilkoski. Both are members of the police department and, and have been and continue to be involved in Project Exile cases. I'd like to welcome your colleagues and thank you for thank recognizing you, sir. And thank you for this opportunity to speak before you today. Project Exile is a product of a desire to explore creative alternative strategies to address the difficult urban <coughs> problems of gun, drugs, and violent crime. The program was developed in late 1996 from a successful partnership between the Richmond Police Department and the United States Attorney for the Eastern District of Virginia. Together with Helen Fahey, the United States Attorney for the Eastern District and the Richmond Police Department, we joined forces to devise a plan to prevent Richmond from experiencing another 1994. Five years ago, a record 160 persons were murdered and 3,500 violent crimes were reported in the city of just more than 200,000 people. Richmond followed the nationwide trend in that its crime problem stemmed from illegal drug trafficking, particularly crack cocaine and the violent competitive behavior associated with illegal drug sales. 
Guns and drugs were commonplace in many of our neighborhoods and on our street corners. And Richard, Richmond was gaining a reputation of having a very high carry rate for guns. Thanks to the tireless efforts and dedication of James B. Comey, Deputy Assistant United States Attorney for the Richmond area, and David Schiller, Assistant United States Attorney and Federal, uh, Chief Federal Prosecutor for Project Exile, a program was created to aggressively target and prosecute firearms-toting criminals in the city of Richmond. From Project Exile's inception, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms was brought on board as a sponsoring federal agency. It became the third member of our team. Agents from this local office are assigned as part of a Project Exile Task Force to aid our officers in their investigation and to adopt cases that meet certain criteria for prosecution within the federal court system under 18 United States Code 922 and 924. As outlined in earlier testimony from the Honorable Mark Early and Attorney um, Helen Fahey, there are eight basic criteria that they had to meet in order to um, meet the standard for the prosecution. A typical project exile case in the city of Richmond would involve an officer who might be assigned to a precinct beat car or to another uniformed or plainclothes unit of air agency, encountering or arresting an individual who is used or is in possession of a firearm. If during the course of the investigation of that incident, it is learned that the person meets any of the previously listed criteria, the case is referred to the Project Exile Task Force for review and possible adoption. State charges may or may not be placed against the person at that time, depending upon the circumstances of the encounter. So this new um, the prosecutorial strategy offered three distinct advantages for us. Number one was stiffer sentencing guidelines for those using firearms in the commission of drug offenses or crimes of violence. Number two was a no bail provision prior to an offender's first court appearance and the likelihood that uh, of serving a number of years in a prison far from home an associate, uh, an associate. So in effect, they would be exiled from the Richmond community. So other agencies soon joined our efforts. The Honorable Mark Early, who testified earlier, assigned members of his staff, as well as our local Commonwealth Attorney, David Hicks, uh, assigned another prosecutor to the U.S. Attorney's Office. Other law enforcement agencies that participated included the Virginia State Police uh, and the FBI. The Project Exile Task Force is, is now staffed with federal, state, and local law enforcement officers, along with federal and state prosecutors. And the Richmond Police Department has assigned three officers to help facilitate the prosecution of these cases. We also have staff that track each case and research all firearms uh, seized by the Richmond Police Department. And we are assisted in our efforts by, of course, the Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms Agency. As has already been mentioned, um, in 1997, when the uh, initiative kicked off, we've experienced numerous set successful prosecutions. Um, in fact, this aggressive prosecution by um, the prosecutors brought to an end, end to the violence by neighborhood-based drug groups such as the Poison Clan and the Dog Pound. Richmond's city manager, along with the city council and its public safety committee, were instrumental in helping to devise and support not only these policing strategies, but also a number of initiatives across the spectrum of city government surf, um, services. As was stated earlier, there was an aggressive marketing campaign, so word began to spread on the street about the impact of Project Exile. Um, they were very aggressive in that marketing campaign and used uh, num numerous uh, private funding sources to help spread the word. So has it worked? Our city residents think so. The daughter of an elderly woman who lives in one of our city's community thanked us recently. She said she had witnessed her mother do something the other day that she had never seen her do before, walk by herself to a corner grocery. The woman's mother had never felt safe enough just to walk a few blocks alone, and she does now. The attitude of Richmond's would-be criminals is changing also. When a Richmond detective recently questioned a suspect about whether he was carrying a gun, the suspect was quick to reply, carry a gun in Richmond? I don't think so. I don't want to go to jail for five years. And as noted also, our statistics speak for themselves. In 1998, it's important to note that Richmond's overall homicide rate was the lowest since 1987. In fact, other violent crime categories decreased also. Uh, this year, our homicide rate is 29% um, lower than it was even in 1998. So compared to our record um, year of 1994, our homicide rate has dropped nearly 60%.
Our efforts through Project Exile, as I've stated, have garnered regional and national recognition. And in fact, other law enforcement agencies now pursue similar avenues of prosecution. In addition, other cities throughout the nation are exploring this effort. But most importantly, our efforts have gained the confidence of our community. The successes of Project Exile has enjoyed in Richmond have helped us to build confidence in the community and credibility in our police department. We view Project Exile as one of our greatest success stories during the past years. It has truly strengthened the partnerships the Richmond Police Department has forged with other agencies and with the community. As we stated, or as Mark Early stated earlier, um, we now have Virginia Exile and the laws closely mirror the sanctions and procedures found in the federal codes. And they will also provide other Virginia localities with aggressive policing tools needed to combat crime violence in their communities. Uh, we continue to work closely with our state and local prosecutors in pursuing aggressive prosecution in state courts while building on our successful partnership with the United States Attorney and other members of our Project Exile team. Thank you. I want to thank you for your testimony. And before we get to questions, we'll hear from Professor Susan Long, who's co-director of the Transactional Records Access Clearinghouse with Syracuse University. Welcome, and you are recognized. Thank you. Mr. You Chairman and members. Pull the uh, mic up as close as you can, if you would. Thank you. Mr. Chairman and members of this subcommittee, thank you for the invitation to come today to testify about the results from a recent research study conducted by the Transactional Records Access Clearinghouse at Syracuse University on the enforcement of federal weapons laws by the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. By way of background, the, <clears throat> the Clearinghouse, commonly known as TRAC, is a data gathering, data research, and data distribution organization at Syracuse University. I, along with David Burnham, who is a research faculty member in the Newhouse School at Syracuse, serve as the center's co-directors. My specialty is statistics, data, and measurement, and I'm a faculty member in the Department of Quantitative Methods at Syracuse's School of Management. TRAC focuses its research efforts on federal enforcement and regulatory activities. Since its founding in 1989, TRAC has sought to provide the American people with comprehensive information about the activities of federal enforcement and regulatory agencies. TRAC's information is based on masses of detailed data that it obtains from federal agencies through the systematic and informed use of the Freedom of Information Act. With the use of a variety of sophisticated statistical techniques, the raw information obtained from the agencies is checked and verified. Where possible, data from one agency is compared with another for general consistency. Detailed studies on specific agencies and topical areas are carried out. We also undertake special studies concerning the accuracy and reliability of data from various government data systems and publish our findings about apparent trustworthiness of official counts that an agency issues about its activities. As part of TRAC's series about each of the major federal law enforcement agencies, TRAC's study on the ATF was published in August of this year. It updated an earlier TRAC study on the ATF that was done in 1996. The full study is available on TRAC's website. I refer anyone interested in more details to the full report. In the brief time I have here, I can only highlight five key findings. First, among all federal agencies, ATF has long been the preeminent federal law enforcement agency in the weapons area. It is the lead investigatory agency in most federal firearms prosecutions, accounting for 82% of all referrals recorded by federal prosecutors with weapons as a lead charge in 1992 and 75% in 1998. Second, the level of criminal enforcement activity of firearms laws by the ATF is down sharply. From a peak in fiscal year 1992, ATF matters sent to federal prosecutors declined by 44 percent, dropping from just under 10,000 in 1992 to a bit over 5,000 in 1998. A similar sharp decline is also shown when ATF referrals to state and local prosecutors, not just to the feds, are included. 
Thus, this decline in ATF criminal enforcement of firearms laws does not represent a shift from federal to state and local enforcement, but an overall decline in the magnitude of ATF enforcement activity at all levels. There is an accompanying graph and table that is in my prepared statement that I would like included in the record. Third. Without objection, that will be made part of the record. ATF staffing levels are also down, although not as sharply. One factor contributing to the drop in ATF enforcement has been cutbacks in its staff. While the number of criminal investigators on the federal payroll grew more than 20 percent between 1992 and 1998, ATF staffing declined. The number of ATF special agents, who are the ones that take the primary lead in criminal investigations, dropped by 14 percent in the last seven years, um, from just under 2,100 in 1992 um, to just under 1,800 in 1998. Fourth point, there is little evidence to suggest that the decline since the mid-90s represent better targeting on more significant matters. When an agency's referrals go into a slump, administrators often assert that this is because its investigators are focusing on a smaller number of more significant matters. Targeting more serious criminals and crimes is a worthy objective. However, such conclusions are always hard to quantify. One possible useful indicator is to examine change in the prison time that results from an agency's investigations. Under federal sentencing guidelines, higher prison times are generally assigned to what society judges as more serious crimes. In the case of the ATF, no clear trend towards more or less serious sentences has occurred. Initially, as referrals fell from their peak in 1992, prison sentences did rise. This would be consistent with a better targeting argument. However, in 1996, median sentences, half got more, half got less, peaked at 57 months. In the next year, the median dropped to 48 months. In 1998, it went to 46 months. Further, the actual number of defendants sentenced to prison terms of five years or more, including life, peaked in 1993 and has fallen sharply since then, particularly since 1996. Fifth and my last point, the study found wide regional variations in how the ATF enforces the law in different parts of the nation. Median sentences resulting from an ATF investigation vary greatly around the country. Some of these variation appear, variations appear to be grounded in the underlying enforcement challenges facing the agency. Arizona, for example, obviously has very different problems than Maine. But the rationale behind some contrasting results is the following are very hard to discern. <clears throat> in three districts, Illinois Central, Springfield, North Carolina East, Raleigh, and North Carolina Middle, Greensboro, the median 1998 ATF sentences were over 100 months. By contrast, the median sentences, half more, half le were less, in Philadelphia East, uh, I mean, excuse me, Pen Pennsylvania East, Philadelphia, New York South, Manhattan, and Arizona, Phoenix, were all 36 months or less. Because the sentencing guidelines limit the sentencing discretion of judges and very few federal cases are decided by a jury, the sentencing variations are mostly the result of the kinds of cases the ATF agents and assistant U.S. attorneys select for prosecution in the different districts. ATF enforcement activities also vary in different parts of the country in terms of the level of activity. In relation to population, there were at least six times more ATF referrals for criminal prosecution in a number of more rural federal judicial districts like Oklahoma North in Tulsa, Tennessee East in Knoxville, West Virginia South Charleston, and North Carolina West Asheville than in major urban centers such as California North, San Francisco, California Central around Los Angeles, Illinois, North, Chicago, and New Jersey, centered in Newark. This concludes my prepared statement. I would like to have the full statement uh, for the record uh, because it does have a number of accompanying uh, tables in one graph. If anyone would like further details concerning this study, 
As mentioned earlier, it is available in its entirety on our website at track.syr.edu under the icon for ATF. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you for your testimony and uh, providing us with this information background for the subcommittee. Uh, Ms. Uh, Gooch, uh, some critics of Project Exile have uh, dismissed uh, the program as assembly line prosecution and said that it takes away from other uh, prosecutions of, say, drug crimes and other uh, Cri uh, other crimes and uh, ac illegal activities. How would you respond? Project Exile is one of the most successful tools that we've used in recent years. I've been a Richmond police officer for well over 20 years, and I've seen the uh, level uh, and rate of violent crime rise. The benefit and the opportunity presented to us through the uh, Project Exile initiative is actually quite simple in that it has allowed us through this partnership, this multi-agency partnership, to expand the capacity of our police department, of our police officers on the street. Um, we recognize uh, the very real danger and the very real impact of the uh, what used to be the high carry rate of guns by criminals on the street. Um, the Project Exile initiative was an opportunity for our officers to use tools, legal tools available to them through the federal system to have a marked impact, a direct and significant impact on the rate of violent crime. Uh, Ms. Long, um, how is your operation funded as a, as a track, uh, this program? Uh, does it receive uh, federal funding or? No, we do not receive any federal funds. We're a self-supporting research center, uh, obviously with support from Syracuse for facilities. Um, and we are, we are supported um, by uh, research grants largely. <clears throat> well, uh, you I appear to be one of the most thorough uh, clearinghouses and sources of information about statistics on a prosecution of uh, gun laws and some of the other activities you've described. Um, have you uh, had difficulty in obtaining information from the federal uh, government or federal agencies uh, to compile your uh, statistical information? Uh, yes, I can certainly say that's true. Uh, in what matter? Have you had to go to court uh, to uh, try to get some of that information? Uh, yes, we certainly have. Um, and um, I have about 30 years of experience in, in using the Freedom of Information Act, um, uh, uh, trying to obtain records from many agencies. And <clears throat> we did have to file a lawsuit against the Justice Department, uh, which resulted in a consent decree um, in this past summer. Um, this sort of capped 10 years of effort on the part of TRAC to obtain uh, these records under several administrations. Thank you. Uh, since we're, we don't have too much time left, we have a vote uh, pending. I'll yield the balance of the time to Mr. Barr. Thank you. And I uh, appreciate uh, uh, Ms. Gucci being here with uh, two of your fellow officers. And I want to commend you and your uh, police chief for the fine job that you've been doing. Uh, and uh, again, as we talked about earlier, we hope that through this hearing today and your continued work and the continued work of the U.S. Attorney, uh, we will see uh, this program and this approach, which is a, you know, a basic approach that really works to simply coordinate better uh, gun prosecutions used in, elsewhere in the country, uh, and I think will benefit uh, our citizens tremendously. So thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, Ms. Long, uh, thank you. Uh, I've, I've read your work. Uh, appreciate the fact that it will be a part of our record. I think it is very, very telling. It's unfortunate that you had to sue the Department of Justice to get information, but uh, at least you did. Uh, and it is somewhat disturbing, and I know that the chairman is concerned about this also, and hopefully we will inquire into it further in, in other proceedings, uh, particularly your work uh, and what it shows regarding a, a very significant drop-off in ATF prosecutions of gun crimes. Uh, notwithstanding their rhetoric that this simply means that they're going after the bigger cases. Uh, that's not the case because it's not reflected in the sentencing, for example, as you've, as you've discovered. Uh, and it's also uh, not a result of uh, lack of funding. 
Uh, and I'd uh, ask uh, unanimous consent, Mr. Chairman, to have inserted into the record the uh, funding uh, figures that I used earlier regarding ATF, uh, which shows, for example, that from uh, 1995 to the current uh, fiscal year, uh, there's been a 50 percent increase in ATF funding. Uh, similarly, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, there has been a virtually identical percentage increase in Justice Department uh, funding of almost 50 percent during this period of time. Now, it may be that both ATF and Justice use that money for different purposes and don't, as in the case of ATF, apparently don't put the money into more agents to prosecute more cases. Uh, but that's a policy decision that they've made. I don't think that there is any way with a straight face, at least, that they can argue it's a lack of resources. We have given them the resources uh, by uh, in hundreds of millions of dollars. Now, if they choose not to use it to prosecute these gun cases, then I think we have a serious problem. But it's not a funding Without uh, objection, uh, those uh, documents and information and will be made part of the record. I would ask uh, unanimous consent, Mr. Chairman, that a further uh, chart here entitled Length of Prison Sentences, uh, 1998 Districts and Rank Order be included, as well as a packet of material, the front page of which is entitled BATF Firearms Prosecution Referrals Drop be included in the record. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, I'd like to... Uh, take this opportunity to thank uh, both of you. I'm going to leave the uh, record open for uh, two weeks uh, for additional information and testimony. We may have additional questions uh, for some of our witnesses uh, here today, but uh, I do want to thank uh, Teresa Gooch, the Deputy Chief of Police of uh, Richmond, for uh, being with us, uh, for sharing with us your successful uh, program and uh, efforts uh, of the community, uh, state and federal agencies uh, to uh, bring a difficult situation under control. Uh, Ms. Long, thank you for being with us and providing us uh, uh, background information from your studies, and we may have additional questions for you. Unfortunately, we do have a vote uh, being called at this time in just a few minutes uh, remaining to go to the floor. But I think this has uh, been a good hearing uh, to review a program um, couldn't be in a more timely fashion to address uh, serious problems relating to uh, gun violence uh, in our streets and our communities. And hopefully uh, the hearing today will uh, highlight the successes of Project Exile and uh, we can also uh, prod our uh, federal agencies to do a little bit jo a better job uh, uh, towards again uh, uh, looking at successful solutions uh, to the problems uh, uh, we've seen uh, again most recently. There being no further business to come before the Subcommittee on Criminal Justice, Drug Policy and Human Resources, this meeting is adjourned. Another group of Democrats also discussed gun legislation today. During a news conference at the Capitol, Senators Charles Schumer and Dick Durbin and Representative Carolyn McCarthy discussed